Thank you, Christine. Um, and um, thanks also to Adam uh, Brow and Sam Dignon, who were up in the booth and uh, controlling things, God. Uh, and they're responsible for that beautiful sound that we heard uh, in part one. Uh, and I'm going to ask you, Peter, about that sound. Um, and uh, <clears throat> you wanted to call the show Songs from the Dime. Um, what's the Dime? Well, the dime is a uh, nickname for, for Skid Row. Uh, um, it, well, actually, the real nickname is a, is a nickel because it's a five square block, but really it's a ten square block, so I call it a dime. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so um, uh, this is uh, what we've just heard is uh, just a bit of a cross section of some of the of your last 25 years in Los Angeles. Yeah, so, some of the memorable people. As a uh, songwriter, um, I mean, how often do you have these um, encounters and you almost can't wait to uh, grab your ball skin notebook and write things down? Uh, <laughs> well, there's or, do you, or do you live in the moment? Well, there's an ebb and flow, you know? I mean, there are some people that I know of that just write a song every day. Uh, the poor old sods like me, there's a, there's a period, there's a fallow period. And, uh, and so the, the songs that we've just heard, uh, Peter uh, is recording, will be recording, and um, yeah. and you, you've got an EP coming out. We've got an EP coming out, and uh, it's actually in conjunction with uh, the archives. Yes. It's going to be a deluxe vinyl. <coughs> That's right. So um, uh, Peter will be back in a couple of weeks, and uh, so so what uh, interested Peter in the in coming to the archive was um, a YouTube clip that we had posted of um, the basics of um, uh, uh, the basics recording a song on our old wax cylinder technology. And Graham McDonald is also uh, here somewhere, and Graham will be recording Peter and one of his uh, new works in our 1880 um, original technology. Really looking forward to that one. That's, that's, that's phenomenal. I mean, it's, it's the other one. And, uh, and so, and so um, just uh, thinking of the sound that those uh, lovely wax cylinder recordings uh, make, um, and back to um, the sound that um, Sam uh, and you worked on for the first set. Um, uh, I'm, I'm interested in uh, kind of from uh, your lovely pop album, uh, Harry's Cafe to Wheels, to kind of 25, 26 years later, um, the kind of musical influences that have kind of brought you to this lovely, um, <clears throat> um, uh, really meaty and interesting sounds that you're playing with now. Yeah, well, I think where it's, it's going, well, this new record will be more of a, more of a jazz, uh, soul kind of record, if that makes any sense, or, like, whereas, you know, conventional pop records, you might use keyboards, you know, you know foundations, you might use in a glass sort of thing. It's, it, yeah, basically jazz, where it, uh, I think it starts and ends at different places. So um, we uh, well we we already had this conversation at lunch, but what I'm, um, uh, what I was interested in asking you about because your uh, uh, you know your sound is so many things it's uh, you know it's gospelly and it's um, uh, it's uh, meaty and lovely. Um, when you were growing up, uh, who were you listening to and, and who were the kind of influences that you can you know. Uh, with the um, lens of time, see, uh, have contributed to the, the music that you're interested in these days? Well, you know, Chris, it hasn't really changed. It was, it's always Marvin Gaye or and Hank Williams, and they're still the people I listen to. I can't get off of it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so it must be um, interesting, um, uh, a boy from the suburbs of Canberra, um, uh, living and working in Los Angeles, and, um, uh, so perhaps Marvin Gaye was gone by the time you moved there, but um, 
you know, kind of meeting and living and working with these people who you'd admired growing up? Yeah, well, that was actually a, a bit of a shock because it was very much a moment to Los Angeles. I was thinking, I'm going to Marvel's town. This is this is this whole. But of course, when I went there, you, what you're really doing is visiting the tombs of the ancient warriors because they're not there anymore. You know, it's like it's time gone by. But um, but perhaps the people that they worked with are still there. And, and so, I mean, particularly some of the people that I know you've worked with worked with, uh, you know, these big names, uh, you know, 20 or 30 years earlier. And, 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 you, uh, and, and you have some really weighty friends, yeah, you know, uh, Linda Ronstadt, for example. Yeah, uh, she sang on your album, you sang on her album? Yeah, yeah. yeah well, it's that, but it's more the, um, I mean, I was really interested in the people, finding some people that actually knew Marvin back in the, uh, that kind of old Washington area where, where he, he bought the house for his, for his parents. And I remember I was there, was a, we lived in an old photographic studio, I remember I would linger out front of some of the um, older people who would walk by and pour them a glass of wine or bowl them a joint and say, tell me about them. Uh, and they all said, sort of said the same thing. They just said, um, he, was, he was the greatest musician, greatest musician in the world, but he couldn't take responsibility for nothing. Not even a pocket ticket. <laughs> Just because you didn't accent then, uh, something I noticed while you were um, talking in the first half is of course that you uh, you lived in Los Angeles for 26 years but you've kept your accent, which is a really difficult thing to do, uh, to not lose yourself when you're in this other culture that's very, very strong. Um, uh, how do you do that? Well, what happened to me was that you, you, you go there and then you start talking like that, you know, and then you, then you go to this thing of how ridiculous it is to be talking like that. So you actually swing way back to, you know, says, come on, mate, for <laughs> Christ's sake, knock it off. <laughs> a bit of gleam speak, which is like, snap out of it, Nick. <laughs> Except, of course, in Hollywood these days, every second person has an Australian accent. Well, it's, uh, the entire cast of Home and Away from 1998. It's popular to be Australian. Particularly if you're an actor or a director, it's a film, absolutely. Uh, and and um, uh, so, so from uh, the, the musicians that you worked with in Australia in the 70s and 80s, I mean, a, a large number of them also kind of migrated over to America. Uh, how many of them uh, did you, uh, how many of them, I mean, you were there for 26 years. I mean, that's, that's a really uh, long time and it must have been hard work. Um, how many of them equally did you kind of, were you able to lean on and spend time with? Well, there was some, um, not many, really, actually. Um, you know, there was a few that had, uh, a few that had bars, you know, the, uh, the Easy Beats drum had this great bar in Beverly Hills that everyone used to go to, you know, so that was a lot of fun. But uh, not a lot of them. Not a lot. I mean, if you're an actor, today about, um, uh, you know, so in, in Los Angeles, um, uh, everyone's really pretty, and it's because, you know, like the prettiest girl from uh, every high school in America and the handsomest, you know, captain of the football team from every high school in America all move to Los Angeles and think they're going to get a job on Friends, um, and, you know, they don't. Um, and um, so, so uh, what, is, what is it like living in Los Angeles? Uh, kind of, you know, having a certain degree of fame, having famous friends, um, but, you know, kind of living on the verge of all these other people who are challenged. Right, well, I don't know, you're, you're, as, you're as good as your last, um, you know, your last thing, really. I mean, that's, a, that's, sort of, that's sort of how it is, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, Peter, uh, Woodhouse sit for Nicolas Cage. This is uh, this is the kind of um, friends that he oh, has that <laughs> in Los Angeles. But it, it's an interesting story because um, uh, uh, well, let's talk about Charlie Sheen. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably not a good time. <laughs> <laughs> it's an interesting story because uh, you know obviously Charlie Sheen you know made, made this big uh, revelation this week, but. Um, 
um, that it, it's, kind of, it's kind of indicative of this uh, kind of lifestyle that exists in Los Angeles where people kind of um, are quite desperate for fame and something. Yeah, well, I guess two thoughts there. I mean, you don't want that kind of fame. And uh, Charlie's the funniest guy you've ever met. I mean, he's the funniest guy you've ever met. Just, I mean, uh, it was never really good that comedy would be his, uh, his what he does. You know? um, so uh, let's go back to Canberra, uh, growing up in the suburbs of Canberra. Um, how, uh, what, was music always your first interest? Well, no, really, it was all about football when I was in Canberra. You know, because uh, the good thing about Canberra is you, you play the four codes. Or you know, you play sorts of football in that game. Who did you play for in Canberra? Well, I played for Marty the Bull Ants and the Wogan Valley Rams. That was great. Yeah, still going. I played for uh, Croatia Deacon in the soccer and uh, what was the Union? Well, the Royals, the Canberra Royals. Well, a couple of, a couple of games at the Royals. Um, and uh, and what, was, what was it that made you uh, make the transition from football to singing? <laughs> I don't know the answer. I didn't know the answer. Well, it was, it was reefer, wasn't it? I mean, so you get, uh, you know, you're playing football and someone rolls up a, a joint and you smoke that and you, you can't hang out with football guys anymore. It doesn't make any sense anymore. <laughs> Peter said it was like literally passing a baton. Yeah, I just can't hang out with you guys anymore. So, uh, so how, long, uh, uh, how long from the first joint to moving to Sydney and uh, starting a band? How long? It wasn't very long. It was a couple of minutes. <laughs> Um, <laughs> uh, and so, uh, so uh, Peter Blakely moves to Sydney, and um, and you have a succession of bands, and uh, kind of you know experimenting, and uh, uh, with kind of different mixes of sounds and people, um, and, and with uh, and with other people who uh, also went on to have very interesting careers. You were in a band with uh, young Chris Bailey. Yeah, young Chris Bailey, and uh, well, that was a trio with Mal Green. And um, uh, and uh, a band with Wendy Matthews, and then later on you went on to uh, support me, Wendy Matthews with uh, Absent Friends. Yeah, Absent Friends, and well, Wendy and I sort of became singing partners, so we would uh, we do a lot of session jobs together. We do that kind of share thing, or whatever. Do you know what the team thing? <coughs> I'll ask you more about share later because I'm obsessed. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> but tell them why. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so I, I did uh, an exchange to Mexico when I was a kid, and um, and uh, the town I lived in, Sabaya, the artist uh, Octavio Acampo did. Uh, he did a Sher cover, and he was like, he was famous for doing the Sher cover. So, uh, and I, uh, in an Australian in Mexico, uh, was very excited to read Peter Blakely and Wendy Matthews on the um, on the liner notes for uh, the Sher album. Um, uh, what Sher like? And Sher cooked Peter Blakely dinner. She, she's a very good cook. This is something that I don't know, know about she. Um, very good pasta cook. You know. The just to be just right. Um, and uh, and so uh, you uh, you. Uh, I mean, in, in a way, uh, you're one of your first kind of uh, uh, public or, or, or more uh, high-profile uh, things was the single that you did with Rock Millens. Although that was the Rock Mother's second single, so they kind of they had a bit, bit of a, a moving um, uh, uh, cast of, of singers. Yeah, rotating uh, singers. Yeah. Uh, but by that stage, you'd kind of you'd already formed this band, and you were in the middle of recording your first kind of solo album. Yeah, we were Rock Mother's on the same label, which was the, um, the notorious Mark, creepy crawly Michael Crawley. So um, yeah. well, there's a few stories with creepy crawly. <laughs> I can give you, I give you the check today, or I can give you the, the cash next Thursday. <laughs> and the, the check just just works. Like <laughs> <laughs> they used to try it on everybody, and uh, some people would have the check. <laughs> try and cash it, it was ridiculous. Mm -hmm. uh, and you, you were saying Peter once had a band, his entire band mutinied and walked out on him because his act, they 
said you he's saying Michael I wouldn't pay them. Yeah. Well that was actually two things that he did. <laughs> and I'm fearful that Michael wouldn't pay them. He said, Well yeah, I'll give you this I'll give all of you the check today. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, is, is there a, a salacious book in uh, uh, in the kind of in your earlier days of Australian rock music, or is it all a blur? It's all a blur. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is a blur. I can't um, and then you uh, signed with Capitol Records, which just must have been very exciting in itself. It was very exciting. Was just, um, I mean, I was just so desperate. And um, so uh, I have to ask about crying in the chapel, but only because it's uh, it's synonymous with your name. Uh, 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 and yet it must be one of those songs that you just must um, be fucking sick to death of, <laughs> or not. I'm pretty sick to death. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but it also must have made you a lot of money for a brief period of time. It was everywhere. Well, it didn't make you a lot of money. It's just a rock and roll. It made someone a lot of money. Made some other Made some other yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, and and with Harry's Cafe de Wheels, um, which they moved by the way, and is now in the uh, in the capital in the capital theatre in the next to the uh, the best ice cream shop in Sydney. There you go. And no longer down on the harbour with rats crawling all over it. It's not even down on the Yeah. It's in uh, it's in uh, Haymarket near the train station. Um, and uh, and so after Harry's Cafe de Wheels, um, kind of big concert tours and travelling the world. Yeah, we did a lot of touring. Um, we did a lot of touring in the Germany, in Germany, in France. Uh, and then um, your follow-up album took uh, some time to come. Yeah, well, we were going to make a second record with Capital, but uh, management weren't happy with how they promoted the first record. <coughs> Looking back at um, kind of uh, the way the music industry used to work, um, uh, was it the was it the artists who were making the money? It doesn't seem like it was the artists who were making the money. No, it's never the artists who make the money. I mean, there's a few select that do, but it's, you know, it's all changed. And so, as a um, uh, an artist who's now uh, uh, back in his home country, yeah. and um, uh, and uh, and the music industry is in a complete flummox, and no one really knows what the new model will be or how it will work. Yeah. Um, how do you uh, how do you ap approach music, and how do you approach ideas like these lovely stories that you want to tell? Well, I just think you um, you just Enjoy what it is you're doing, and that's really what, is, what you've got to do. And as a, as a, a musician and artist, you really can't really think about that. If that makes any sense, you know. What you do, you just can't, because if you do it, just uh, it's just too crazy. And it's never. I mean, that's never changed for me. It's like, you know. We've we've been playing these um, uh, uh, games over lunch. Uh, what was your big Hollywood moment? Uh, but uh, I'm going to ask you what your big Rock star moment was oh, first. So I can't see the Elliot at all. Well, we, we, yeah, no, we'll, we'll get to the Hollywood uh, moment in, in a second. Because I just remembered. <laughs> okay, Peter Blakely, uh -huh. 26 years in Hollywood. What was your big Hollywood moment? Big Hollywood moment was um, I have a friend, Cody Ryan McLaughlin, who's an actor. Really sweet guy. He, he can't act to save himself. But, but everyone loves him and he's really lovely, buddy. Well, every year he gets, well, not every year, but the last two years. You know, every studio, they, there's a certain amount of sitcoms that are going to get made. And uh, he, he got down to the last one, the last two years. And the last one was this show called um, Genetically Challenged. Um, which I thought, Cody, this is it, you've done it. <laughs> <laughs> this is the guy that throws five Ripplings down the throat in the, in the shower in the morning. You know, this is perfect. Anyway, I went to, the, they, sh they shoot a pilot for it. So I go down and I'm in this little trailer. And there's a knock on the door, and uh, I go into the door, and I say, "Are you Elliot Gould?" Because I remember Elliot Gould as like one of the real, as a great actor, you know, like just go 
on forever. And poor old Elliot hasn't acted for 30 years. He hasn't had a job for 30 years. And he's just busting his ass to get on the show. Get his and they make this decision to go, oh, he's too old. He's the dad. My suggestion would be um, appearing on Hey Hey It's Saturday. Yeah. Crazy exciting. That would be Daryl Saunders, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, that's good. <laughs> um, so uh, for the second part of our show, uh, Peter is going to have a look back at uh, some of his songs from the last 20 <coughs> years. 20 years. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much, uh, Peter Blakely. And